From the I don't know what to say. I'm just speechless. To the we see all sorts of life-changing moments at McKinney Competitions. How would you react? Cars, houses, tech bundles and more. From just £2 a ticket, no purchase necessary. For competitions, rules and conditions, see mckinneycompetitions.com. They kept a horse upstairs. Okay. <laughs> and a horse looking out through a window, was uh, an upstairs window was comical. How they got the horse up the stairs or down the stairs, I do not know. I am proud of that. Yes, I'm. I'm, I'm proud. Of, I'm, I'm. I'm particularly proud of it, of um, completing an Ironman when I was seventy. Yeah. Because I don't think it's, I don't know if there's anybody in Ireland who's done that yet. I was I had a wee van and I used to carry the van's gear and uh, we got an audition for Opportunity Knocks. Oh, there you go. So um, we were to go to Belfast and take all our gear and the boy said to me, um, "You better, you better put the PDS system in." I says, "You don't need a PDS system because." I came back about three hours later and the boy said to me, where were you? I said, I went into the Belfast. There was a band going to give us, going to lend us their PA. Oh no. <laughs> so twice it was on your head. It was twice on my head. <laughs> so after listening for a while, Billy says, right, off you go. So that was the only game, I think, in history that the referee was sent off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> podcast guest this week needs no introduction for anyone from Newry or around the South Armagh area. He wears a lot of hats uh, as a writer, a journalist, a musician, an Ironman and triathlete, but mostly Tony Bagnall is a storyteller. He was a journalist for many years and he's written eight books about local sports and the places he's grown up. This is your host Elaine Ingram and here's Tony to tell us some of his stories now. So I am here with um, the legendary. <laughs> was pretty softly. <laughs> well, anybody in Newry or South Armagh or around these parts knows Tony Bagnall. Um, for in whatever guise, it could be either through your um, your show bands, your writing, your triathlon, and um, your football. You know, you you wear so many hats, Tony, and you have excelled at so many. So you really do need no introduction in these parts. <laughs> <laughs> what is it to say? Um, doing a lot of things, but 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 none of them good, none of them well. <laughs> no, I think you're being. Now that's another thing that we could say about you, Tony, is that you're always um, very modest. <laughs> Actually, you had on one of your Facebook um, things the other day because you were writing about um, a singer. Was it Patricia? Grappen. Patricia Grappen, yeah. And um, at the end of the story, you said um, it was Patter. It was Patter Khan stood in for Patricia Grappen. Mm. No, Patricia Grappen stood in for Patter Khan, which was the best singer in Ireland, our best singer in Uri, covering for the second best singer in Uri, and we were a we were a, a very very poor band. So you said for <laughs> probably the worst band in Uri. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I mean about the modesty, but. Tony, let's take it take us back to to the beginning. So you have to tell me about where you're from, um, around here and um, Linen Hall Square, and what was it? What is it you called them? It uh, was it was called the Barracks. Yeah. It was it was it, it was it's actually Moonview Park now. Yeah. And it's about it's only about half a mile from here. From I live in the Armagh Road. So yeah, you're living here. We're here now in the Armagh Road. Yeah, and this is where you live now. But you're from this is where you're from. I'm from Linen Hall Square. I was yeah. reared in Linden Hall Square, yeah, along with Charlie Casey. Yeah. Charlie Casey was um, a neighbour, um, yes. and it was a very, very poor area. We, we uh, Nobody had anything in the barracks. Everybody was very, very poor. Um, in fact, there was one house that was, was only about 20 or 30 yards from me. They kept a horse upstairs. Okay. <laughs> And a horse looking out through a window was uh, an upstairs window was comical. How they got the horse up the stairs or down the stairs, I do not know. Uh, Patricia Grattan, the best singer ever came out in Uri, uh, was um, rather right close beside me too. She was in. She's a Barakovian, as we call yeah, people this is from the, the Barakovian. Now, this yeah. is your own local um, colloquialism. Charlie Casey keeps calling himself a Barakovian. He's very right. proud. That and he uh, he's very proud that he was um, he was a Barakovian and Charlie actually lives not a hundred yards from from the barracks now even yeah you know so uh, and you stayed in Uri like 
all your life, have you? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a urine yuck. You're a urine yuck, as they say. And, yeah. Um, yeah, because you've spent years and you've written... How many books have you written? I've written eight books uh, up, to, up, to now, up to now, yeah. I've written, the more recent one was uh, The History of Newry Celtic. Yeah, that's the one that you just, that's just been launched, The History of Newry Celtic. And yeah, tell us about that then. Um, Laurie Griffin came up to me one time and asked me would I do a wee, a wee booklet for uh, a 25 year anniversary of the winning the Mid Ulster Shield. And I says, Laurie, and maybe I could do a book for you if you want. So we talked about it and um, they agreed. And I, I, I met the committee. And um, I says, in fact, boys, where do I tell you? I actually played for Newry Celtic. And uh, I only played one game before they got rid of me. And I said to, <laughs> and I said to, the, to, the, to a guy who was in, who's on the committee, who's actually the, ch- uh, the chairman of the club, Q Carl, I says, could you remember me playing for, um, playing for Celtic? I do, he says, who do you think got rid of you? <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, yeah, but the book um, the book went down very well. They had launched their... Um, in Nan Rices. In yeah. Nan Rices, yeah. And uh, the place was packed. Maybe, <laughs> maybe packed, maybe packed too, uh, too much. Yeah. Uh, but it was packed and everybody... In this day and age. <laughs> yeah, in, the, in this day and age, yeah. Um, it was packed and the book... Um, the, the, the sold a lot of copies from the book, you know. Yeah. And in fact, there's a guy called Martin Green who I and a lot of other people think was the best footballer ever come out in Uri. He was at the launch and he rang me a few days afterwards looking for another, he bought two books and he looked for another five books. Well, I'm not surprised, Tony, because there's nobody um, in the town, there couldn't possibly be anybody in the town that knows as much about the, fo- the history of football around here than you do. I mean, um, you said you have a Windmill Stars one in the pipeline. But th- that book is finished, including the complete history of Windmill winning the Junior Cup. Right. Um, and they're the only team to win the Junior Cup in the last 52 years since the Caribbean League started. The only Caribbean League team ever to win the Junior Cup. Right. The last team... We won't talk about Bestbrook. Bestbrook won two finals and never, yeah. and, never, and, never um, and, and, and lost both of them unluckily with late goals, I think, you know. Yeah. Um, the famous Newry Shamrocks, one of the, the biggest clubs ever to to come from the New York area, um, they reached the Junior Cup final and didn't win it either. Salic were the, or Windmill Stars were the only team to win it. Yeah. Um, it was a wee bit bittersweet for me in that my son was a part of that panel and didn't get didn't didn't get selected uh, in even the squad for the final. Oh dear. <laughs> so uh, so it was a as there was a bittersweet mo- a bittersweet moment for me uh, that uh, and that day um, that they won it. Yeah. But um, it's quite. I've done a quite a, a whole history of windmill winning, it all, including I spoke to every one of the players who played in the final and people connected with the club and everything else. You know, so. And what year was that that they won? Um, two thousand and two. Right. Um, they won it, and there's nobody's won it since. Or, or, and the last, the last team to win the junior cup, Pat Jennings was playing as a sixteen-year-old. Wow. Which was nineteen sixty two. That I says think. a lot about the competition itself, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean it's yeah. a tough it's a, very, it's a very tough, tough competition to win. to win. I mean the the piece I and when I spoke to all the all the boys were all absolutely ecstatic. Uh, even today about winning it. They, they said that when they won it they didn't realise just how big it was. Yeah. You know? And what was the other book you've written? Uh, your, your, the other book that you A book I've, I've done the history of Camera Rovers as well. Yeah. And uh it, it it went down well now. It, it, it went down well as well. Uh, Jackie Mooney came and asked me what would I be interested in doing it. So I done it and it was it, it, it turned out well and I was delighted to do it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, well, I suppose, I mean, you're a writer. I mean, you're a journalist. <laughs> a a long time journalist. Yeah. And people ask me how I get into journalism. I said, I get into journalis- journalism from a welding background. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was a welder all my life till I was about forty eight or forty nine, and then I discovered I could write. And, and think, while, and, while welding, pardon? While welding, <laughs> that was that was my lead up to it. <laughs> I had no qualifications whatsoever, just that I could. I was able to put words together, and in fact, I still think that I've done a lot of things in my life, most of them badly, <laughs> but I still think that I have a bit of talent as a writer. 
but nothing else. Not as a, I played football, I was a, a triathlete and I played in bands. I never much, I never had much time to know any of those things except that I could put words together. But well, I um, don't know. About, I don't know about I don't know about that. But I do know that you gave me um some very good words of advice when I was um uh, when I was writing, and I still stick to them to this day. Um, one was always um bring a pencil to a game, not a pen. <laughs> Because when you're at a Carmbane League game, it inevitably is going to rain. Yeah. So a pencil is the only thing that works. And the other one was, um, don't use the word very. Yeah. <laughs> I don't use the word and very still, myself. And, yeah, and I don't use the word very because you always said it's more impactful if you don't say very. It wasn't a very good game. It was a good game. Yeah. I think <laughs> I, I think I think it's more it's, it's more effect when you when it's more effect. In fact, when you don't say a very right enough. Yeah. yeah, you told me that a long time ago. <laughs> a good few years ago now. Uh, but you were the um, sports editor in the Democrat, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. For a long time. Um, I'd say about, maybe about eight or ten years, I think. Yeah, so did the sports come first to you and then the writing? I liked, I liked, I always loved sport, obviously. I, I didn't realise I could write until... I started to do a few wee um, match report for Jimmy Davis, right. and, and the, the 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 legendary uh, new reporter, uh, sports editor. Yeah, he is and did we piece? I did we pieces for him. So then I went. The Democrat opened, and I said to the to the editor, I think it was Michael Savage. Michael Savage owned the the, the Democrat along with um, Terry McLaughlin. Way back in nineteen ninety four, when I went down and asked Michael Savage would he um would he like me to do a few match reports, and he says um yeah he says we'll give you a few pound every Christmas. I says no, I want, I want a few <laughs> pound after I do after I do the reports. So he says okay, so that was okay. So that's, that got me started, and um and I've been writing since. Yeah, and doing photography as well. Yeah, but I wouldn't be. I would. I don't really. I don't really tap that as a good photographer. I take pictures, but um. I don't really, I don't really have a great eye for a picture, but um, as long as the pictures are sharp, that's what most people are. That's what most people are worried about, and I, and I, um, I'd be, I would like to get to keep my pictures sharp, but that's basically it. Yeah. Um. But long before that, Tony, um, you were when you grew up, you were um in a few different bands. <laughs> <laughs> the show band. And was... you've also written a book about show bands, which is yeah another. Another writing, a part of your writing career. But tell us about the show bands and tell us about your first guitar. Uh, I bought this guitar off a guy called Blue McCamley, who's dead now. And um, it was a very poor guitar, but I thought it was great. But I bothered and thumped at it. And uh, my father used to say, Will you stop that rumbly thump every time, you know, with, with the guitar? I was a very poor guitar player. And, and I wasn't a good musician either. <laughs> and that's the truth. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that. My talent didn't lie. I love music. But fortunately, music didn't love me. I just played, I played in patterns and played in things in my head. Um, I played, I played guitar and then I, play, I started to play bass, which was a wee bit easier. And um, I just stuck to the simple parts. And I wasn't, I wasn't, I wouldn't class myself as, as a good musician. But I love music, and I love. I played in a week in a, a, in a band called the Sons of Rest. Yeah, which, which is a cool name. It was a brilliant name. The name was great. The, the, the band may not have been as good as the name. The name was uh, the name was written <laughs> the name was written on the wall in Lynn Hall Square. It, it was a big name. The Sons of Rest. It meant that um, the people in Lynn Hall Square didn't work. You know, the Sons of Rest. All oh, right. And uh, we got that name, and uh, we played. And Charlie Casey's brother John uh, played in the band with me. Um, and John's the only one of the band that I'm part of myself that are still alive. The other, the other three are dead, you know. Well, uh, that's a shame. But you did tell tell us about you had to have a uniform. Um, show oh, bands, show bands had uniforms in those days. That was a very important part of of this whole thing. Yeah. So how what happened with that? <laughs> well, we went to um, there was a guy who owned there was a guy who whose parents owned a shop in Erskine Street called Kevin Powell. He owned a wee shop called the Man Shop in History, and told us to come down and he would give us a uniform. So we all went down and got our uniforms. And the drummer Willie what, Riley. What, what were the uniforms? What did the uniforms? It was it was it was um a pair of cord black cord trousers, uh, a shirt, and um a wee tartan waistcoat. That was the uniform. Anyway, 
uh, we all got our uniforms and were, were, were to pay a half crown a week, which was what's that, what, 12 and a half pay a week, what would I pay for them. Uh, but anyway, the drummer went down at a later date and he went in and uh, the, the boy gave him the, the, the waistcoat and the trousers and the shirt. He said, would you like a, would you like an overcoat? Yeah, that on, yeah, yeah. Would you like a pair of shoes? Yeah. He took everything, he took out, his arm, he out of the shop with a pile of gear. And uh, and he says, now, that, that, you have to pay your half a crown every week. No bother, he says. So he gave him a half a crown. And it was a guy called Willie Riley, as I say, who was a drummer. And uh, he lived next door to the people who had the horse looking out through the window. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Willie never, never gave him any more money. And one day, Kevin Powell stopped Willie in the street and said to him, uh, Willie, um, you never paid, you never gave me any, um, you never gave me any, any more money. Um and Willie looked him up and down and said, Listen, don't you ever, don't you dare stop me in the street and ask me for money again. Now, F off and away he went. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a, that was a, that was a, that was a son's arrest. I don't think we lasted that long. Only played two or three years. He had a manager though. Oh, but a manager called Frank, Frank Morney. Okay, what about him now? Uh, Who's the manager who was going to take you places? He said, I, I, he said, <laughs> we'll make you famous. And he, he got our picture taken and, um, he, he, uh, he got we we cured because I still have I still have a couple of them, and uh, he the first date we had was in the St Coleman's Hall, the bucket it was called the bucket then, and uh, we went down and the boy said to me at half time, "Don't get the money, don't get the money." And I said, "What about fancy? Don't worry, but you could down you could get the money." So I, it was um, two pound and fifty pounds, which meant fifty p each. We all got fifty p each. So I I handed out the fifty p to everybody, and at the end of the night, Frank said. Um, Right, boys, he, he was dressed in a, in a very flashy suit and everything else. Boys, I'll go down and get the money now. We said, I'm okay. <laughs> That's okay. So we went down to Mickey Carlin, who who was who owned a, um, a record shop in Hilsley and was running the Carlin's, bucket. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Carlin Records. And uh, he went down to Mickey and Mickey told him, the boys, the boys were down here and got the money. And he came back up again and, where's that money? And nobody knew anything. We, we, everybody played the uh, innocence. Played them. <laughs> yeah, so that was the last we seen of the manager. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded sound like a share of chancers. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're very decent boys. <laughs> um, so and the, the show band thing then, um, did the, how long did that last overall? We played in a show band called uh, the Clippertone Show Band. Okay. And uh, we weren't a great band, but, but we, we enjoyed it. And uh, um, we travelled all around the country, mostly... Uh, with very very little money, um, and if the, the the promoters of the dance thought there was going to be very few people at it at the dance, so it'd say the band's on fifty percent of the door. Right. So if there was nobody there, so there's nobody there. Half, oh, the boys used the boys used to say, "What's a half and half?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so would would come out of there with very very little money generally, uh, maybe a pound or two or something. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have paid for expenses for the. For the van, yeah, but that was a time. Um, like show bands were huge around that time, weren't they? No, I but mean, they had in a, Ireland, that was a big era. That was the era of show bands, really, wasn't it? That was the era of show bands, yeah. And there were some very, there was some really top class show bands. Fortunately, the Clipper Tones, unfortunately, Clipper Tones weren't one of them, <laughs> <laughs> weren't one of those, uh, weren't one of those top bands. But played, we had a singer called Ivan McConville. We made a lot of records, and he was tragically killed in a car crash uh, a while after that. A while after the, after he, he he left our um, Clipper Tones band. But bands were were really really big, and they got a lot of money. But as I say, unfortunately, we didn't we didn't we didn't get we didn't get them. Uh, we had a, a guitar player called Mickey Mallers, which was a very good guitar player, but a good band. Uh, except for you. Except for me. <laughs> 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 no, there's a few good. There's a few. There's a few good guys. I'm it? sure uh, you were good, Tony. No, well, I, I'll be honest. I, I definitely wasn't, and, <laughs> and, and I thought I could sing too. But uh, unfortunately, I didn't have a note in my head. But I went up and shouted and roared on the microphone. <laughs> but I mean, I'm sure it was great fun. All the same, I mean, traveling around the country in a van with a bunch of lads. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it was. Yeah, back. yeah. But as I say, when you go to maybe you wait to. I remember we played in uh, Wayne County Galway and everywhere else, and you were coming home at maybe 
at seven or eight o'clock in the morning and have to get up for work and then have to go and stay to work wasn't all that um yeah you weren't like a band that was yeah i am um, on the road but um had enough money to survive that. yeah but there's a, most, a lot of bands were, were professional then they, they, they like that's all they did you know so they came home they came home and go to bed but the, the rest of us had to had to go out and work but the, there was hundreds and hundreds of bands around around Ireland. well that's it maybe the market was saturated yeah yeah, <laughs> but there was um, there's a lot of there was a lot of um, the like the like of Dickie Rock and Brenton Boyer and what a pack places you know and they would have got big big money. Fortunately, unfortunately, the club rooms weren't in that league. <laughs> <laughs> but I did I, I did a book on show bands called You Come Here Often, and um, and I printed a thousand copies and I've, I've virtually them all sold. Um, they sold them at there was a show in Belfast run by George Jones. Uh, called you come here often, and I asked them would they would they sell the books for me? They said yeah, no bothers. And they sold a lot of books for me. Yeah, because it's the kind of thing that people are really interested in because it was such a huge era and it just sort of faded away, didn't it? The show band era. It did, yeah. Well, in the in the seventies come in. You see, they were playing in we halls away in the in the back end of nowhere. Yeah. And there was no drink in them. You see, so then learned to start to come into their own and country medicine come in and, and people could drink and not travel into the countryside. They, yeah. they, could, they could stay in the town. So basically that that that, uh, that killed the show band uh, scene. Yeah. And, but do you think the music sort of stayed popular itself? Music, the music was popular. Definitely the music was popular. Like everything else, it... It, it, it just faded it, away. It, 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 it faded but away. But you got yeah. a good few years mileage out of it. Did oh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I loved it. I mean, it was it was it was, it was brilliant. It was brilliant looking back on the and and the stunts that people get up to about different bands get up. Have to you them. any mad stories uh, <laughs> <laughs> that you can tell us no, that are maybe, uh, printable or maybe, that are <laughs> maybe not printable? Uh, we actually played. I remember one time I was I had a wee van and I used to carry the band's gear and uh, we got an audition for Opportunity Knocks. Oh, there you go. So. um we were to go to Belfast and take all our gear, and the boy said to me, um, "You better, you better put the PA system in." I says, "You don't need a PA system because when you go to when you go if you go to an audition, there's bound to be microphones and and PA's. There. Okay, they said, "Well, be it in your head." So I said, "I can see where this is going." <laughs> yeah. So we went down there. Q Green came out. Uh, he was a Huey Green, he was a famous. Yeah. Do you remember Huey Green? I, I do. I'm old enough to remember Opportunity Knox and yeah. <laughs> Huey Green. Well, yeah. Huey Green came out and he says, um, "Where's your PA?" Well, I didn't take one. No, you're uh, off. You're you're um, you're, 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 not, you're not getting on. There's a lot of other uh, bands there and people there for auditions, you know. So he knocked so, your opportunity. Uh, so I was uh, I was so annoyed. I was really really annoyed about it, and uh, I I get into the van and we into we into Belfast. Um, uh, we had the city centre or something and I was doing something I came back about three hours later and the boy said to me where were you? I said so we did it about fast there was a band going to give us going to lend us our PA oh no <laughs> so twice it was on your head it was twice on my head <laughs> <laughs> so I let our band I let, I let the band down badly I let the band down badly that night <laughs> yeah you certainly did I'd say that was a long drive home yeah and nobody's speaking to me <laughs> yeah <laughs> and there was another time we went to we went to play in Scotland, I think. The, the boys come up to me at 12 o'clock on a Saturday and said, we're playing in Glasgow tonight. I says, what? And you were in Uri. We're in Uri. <laughs> and but no, nobody had, nobody, um, the, the, the agent rang him up and said that a date in Scotland for us that night. Um, well, I want to hear how you got there now. <laughs> so anyway, I took the guitar player, the guitar player, two guitar players and myself, Pile, pile our stuff into the van and we went to the, we went to the docks and we just made the boat. Unfortunately, the other five were standing on the quay as the boat pulled out. <laughs> they missed it. And they actually then, they, they changed our gig from Glasgow to Stranraer. So the boys come in they, 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 and we had to actually start at 8 o'clock and we started at 8 o'clock with, with uh, two, three guitars, I think it was. That was it. Um, um, we had we had the gear, PA game, the gear shut up, and we started to sing. And next thing, the, all the rest of the band came in. The, place, the hall was packed as well. And the next thing, the rest, the other boys came in. And the first thing that happened was, um, as soon as the first number was everybody in, the, the speakers went on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody said, "We got a warm welcome in Scotland." <laughs> you certainly did. Yeah, literally got a warm welcome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
So that was your um, musical career? That was my musical career, yes. Get ready to shake up summer with the Get Active ABC Sunshine Fill Program for kids and families. Get set for land-based adventure at our summer schemes, or why not get adventurous and maybe get wet at our Splashtastic Water Sports Summer Program. There are so many things to do, and all we need is you. See getactiveabc.com slash summer for all the details. Tony, you have a, a lot more beyond music because um, you've also done triathlons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, how did you get into that? I don't know how you find time for all this stuff, by the way. But anyway, how did you get into triathlons and um, and that kind of thing? Well, in in the in, in the eighties and the in, in in the early eighties. Uh, a friend of mine used to used used to used to do a wee bit of running before before we played football. Um, uh, we used to play wee wee games in Cairn Bay and, and we used to go for wee runs. So, um, we we decided that would would enter for a marathon. So we entered for a marathon and we got a spot called Paddy McCamley and myself, um, and we um we got through it okay. I think I did I think I did three sixteen or something like that. And Paddy done about three twenty five. He said that's me finished. So I. I I said I'm enjoying this, so I'll I'll and I'm 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 going reasonably well. So I said my target would I would try and get under three hours, which is most marathon runners' target. Right. So, um, so it's been very hard, and I actually got under three hours, and um, I got down to um, actually got down to two fifty three, um, which I was That's delighted brilliant. with. Pardon. Well, this is coming from somebody who wouldn't run for a bus now, but that is brilliant. Well, it, you see, and the thing was, again, I didn't have a lot of talent as a runner. Now, I'm not, I'm not being, I'm not being. Whenever I was running, I've seen you running. Awful looking. I've never seen anybody right. look so miserable. Yes, exactly, exactly. And as I say, I, I tell people, people say, I've seen you running the other day, and you look terrible. I said, well, appearances can be very deceptive. Could you see the way I look? Well, I feel ten times worse. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I got I, I was able to I was on I went under three hours on um on four occasions, so I was very pleased with that. But then it was it was a triathlon started in Uri. and you love swimming now. You have to say you do like the swimming, don't you? I do like swimming now, but and you like cycling. Yeah, it's just yeah. the running bit you don't like. Well, I can't run now anyway, but um, I always got running the hardest. But I think most people get running the hardest. I can't run at all. Yeah, but it's I it walk hard. anywhere. I just don't yeah. like running, though. It's the breathing. R- running, uh, and uh, I just see people running, and they never have any trouble with breathing. I always have trouble with breathing. I always gasp yeah, for breath. I think it just must, yeah. It's, 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 it's in your makeup. It's in your, it's I in your, so it's in your makeup. But um, Newry had a, Newry had a triathlon, I think it was 1983. It was one of the first triathlons in Ireland. And so I said, right, I can swim a wee bit and I can run and I can bike. So I, so it so I did it. And but then I, I, I was a, we formed a Uri Triathlon Club and um, you swim up at Camilla Lake. I was actually swam for an hour in Camilla Lake this morning. Right. Yeah. Good so, for you. So, but anyway, um, every year we went to to Sligo for the Irish Championship. Um, and Uri had a good team. And I think we won the team award a couple of times. Um. And I was always in the first twenty, maybe, and it was maybe four hundred in the race. You know, I was never up. I was never up at the top, but I was reasonably strong, so I was okay. So then I decided that I would try an Ironman, and there was nobody in there was nobody in the Newry area or anywhere else around here had ever done an Ironman before. And what does an Ironman now consist of? An Ironman consists of um, two point four mile swim, which is equivalent of one hundred and fifty four lengths of pool. Yes. Um, 112 mile bike and a 26 mile marathon. And what age were you, Tony, when you took this on? I was about, I think it was about 38, whatever. Nice. Um, so there was nobody in Ireland, sorry, there was nobody in Uri, and the Uri area had done one. So I was actually the first one in the Uri area. I went to Almere in, in Holland to do it, and uh, there was, um, and it was the first one from around this area to do it. And I've also got another wee, um, uh, how would you put it? Achievement in that 
and the oldest one. Uh, I was going to be going to that, Ireland, I think. Yeah, you, you're the oldest person in Ireland to, to, to do an Ironman. To do an Ironman. Well. Iron that was that only a few years ago. I did that when I was, se- when I was 70. Yeah. Um, it was hard now, but my TV. Well, how do they compare now, doing the first one when you were 38 and doing the one when you were 70? <laughs> well, what, what's the, 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 the main differences in um, how difficult? The main difference was um, when I was. When I did the first one, I could run a wee bit. Yeah. When I'd done the last one, I'd run very little. I could run very. I could. Is it the knees that go? No. You get older. No, it was just. I was just. Um, I all, never, never really troubled my knees. I was very, very lucky in that I was strong. In that my knees didn't, didn't, and my ankles didn't go. It was just I couldn't breathe, and it just breathing. Yeah. Just wasn't. Um, I'm just not a natural runner. Yeah. And when I started doing triathlons, I was a good runner by triathlon standards. An average cyclist and a very poor swimmer. And now my swimming's not bad. My cycling's poor enough, and my running is non-existent at all. <laughs> you know, so it's so it's. Uh, but I still would. I still would. Um, but you did the tra- You did the Ironmans, and you got through them. I mean. Yeah, I did five altogether. Five. Yeah. I mean that that's a huge achievement. I mean, you have to be. You have to be proud of that. I am proud of that. Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm proud. I'm. I'm, pr- I'm particularly proud of the uh, of. Um, Complete an Ironman when I was 70. Yeah. Because I don't think, I don't know if there's anybody in Ireland who's done that yet. Yeah, I think. I was the first one to do it as, as a 60 year old as well, you know. So I don't know if there's anybody has. Um, How did you feel when you finished it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> terrible. Uh, no, it was, it, you'd be okay the next day. Um, funny enough, um, recovery from an, an Ironman is not as bad as recovery from a flat out marathon. I when you uh, when I was running marathons, I were going as hard as I could in the start. Um, an Ironman, it's 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 a you're not running that hard, and there's a run it's a running that takes out of your legs. It's not cycling doesn't take it out of you. Swimming doesn't take it out of you. Right. But running definitely take beats up the legs. So if you're going hard as a runner, the next days and for or maybe weeks after that, you could you could struggle. Really. Yeah. When whenever we're doing marathons, we used to come down the stairs backwards. Oh, really? Yeah, because you couldn't, whatever it was, <laughs> it was easier to come downstairs backwards. On your thighs, as well as it would be. Yeah, and the back of your legs and everywhere, yeah. But you get over them and, and it's it's all memories. So, but why do, you, why do you do it now, Tony? You say you hate running or you're not a good runner. Yeah. So it's not for pleasure. It's, is it, what, what, what drives you? Yeah, people say, people say to you, did you enjoy that, did you enjoy that run, Tony? No. Did you enjoy that triathlon, Tony? No. Did you enjoy swimming? No. And why do you do it? I said, very simply, people confuse enjoyment with satisfaction. You get a lot of satisfaction out of doing it. When you do that, when you when you um, when you finish whatever you're doing, it's very satisfying. I, when I was running, I mean, I had been, as you say, you see me running, terrible looking. And I, would, and <laughs> I am being a bit facetious when I say that, but. No, I'm actually not. It is true. You no, do, it is you look, true. You look no, it pained. is true. Yes, <laughs> and when you get to the door of the house and stop, yeah, it's lovely then. Yeah, it's an achievement. It's like it's an achievement. I, yeah. I, even yeah. even even a run, even a even a four mile run or a two mile run or a mile run, or whatever. When you get back to the door, it might be hard when you're doing it, but it's it's very satisfactory. Yeah, it gives you a lot of satisfaction. As I say, even, and it keeps you fit and healthy. Keeps you fit and healthy. Well, I don't know about that either. <laughs> oh, really? There's a lot of there's a lot of top class um athletes throughout their career and the trouble now with the heart. Really? Yeah, I don't know. It it was supposed to it was supposed to be when you're running it's supposed to be good for your heart. But the time is stress and over stressing over the years is uh, is not good for it. Yeah, I suppose. So it's hard to know. So I can just sit on the couch and watch TV and read <laughs> <laughs> Probably, probably right. Probably, yeah. It's, um, it's, nobody, it's, it's hard to know um, what's, the, what's the right thing. I suppose it's moderation, and, uh, like everything. If, if you do, if you probably, if you exercise moderately and don't do Ironmans, you'll probably be grand. It's Although, to... Tony, you're, you're, I mean, you're, you're obviously very healthy. I, I am reasonably healthy, yes, I think so. And I'm glad that I'm, I've reached this stage in my life that... That that I can do still do everything for myself and I can I can still I still would I wouldn't say train but I exercise every day I would I would do maybe twenty mile on the bike one day and then the next day I would I would swim maybe hundred lengths of the pool 
or and whatever as I say and then if if we couldn't cycle I would walk maybe five or six miles as hard as I could but again it's a, I'm always competitive I'm going along on the bike and and somebody passes me um, I don't think they don't have to be very good to pass me now um, <laughs> I'm trying to catch them and I know I've no chance of catching them but I'm still the competitive edge is still there all the time you, know. so you do have that competitive nature. Yeah, that's what it is. Well, what age are you, Tony, if you don't mind me asking? I'm 76. You're 76. Well, you, you certainly don't look it. Yeah, I look 96. <laughs> <laughs> um, you played a bit of football in your time. Uh, I know you said you played for Wimbledon Stars for a game. Uh, no, for Celtic, 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 yes. Game. Yeah. But um, um, who else? Have you played for the, did you play for the town? Actually, I played for the town one. Uh, actually, played for the town. I have a story there too as well. I played for I played for Newry reserves, and as again, I wasn't a good footballer. <laughs> I love football, and I was. I'm gonna scrap this whole podcast, Tony, because you're telling me you're no, no good. But at this, no, but I'm, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you I could write, and that's it. Um, as a footballer, I was the slowest on the field, no speed whatsoever, and uh, Sean McCracken. Was a manager, a friend, good friend of mine, was a manager at Newry Reserve, uh, Newry, uh, Newry Second or Newry Reserve one time. And uh, the first game I played, he said, he, he, he actually showed me his notebook at a later, uh, later, he showed me this in his notebook at, at a good few years after this. He says, Tony Bagnell, big strong lad, um, worked hard on the field, a good asset to the team. Um, the next week, Tony Bagnell, uh, did okay, but tend to be caught in possession a bit. The next week, Tony Bagnell, I don't know what I'm going to do with him. Uh, uh, he, he was caught in possession too much, he's too slow. The fourth week was, this boy is a liability. <laughs> <laughs> and that, like my school report. Is that, was, that, was, that was, I, 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 he gave me that one time we were going to a race. He showed me, he says, there's my road big Tony, read that. And there's a guy with me and he laughed his head off at it. <laughs> Four games, I think, I played for Newry Reserves. Each one of them st- got steadily worse. <laughs> because I hadn't I had, I would have worked hard all the time. Uh, uh, I thought I could play football. I thought I could pass the ball. I don't think I could. Um, but it was too slow, and I had no football brain. You need to have. Uh, I was miles ahead, a mile behind everybody else, as far as thinking <laughs> was concerned. <laughs> so that, that's my football career and I played in seven cup finals and, and lost them all I think no I think I won one I think I won the last one well who were you with for the cup finals um, I was with a team called the Hibs were the bad team uh, um, well they must have thought you were good enough they kept you on for seven cup finals <laughs> <laughs> well I don't think I played I don't think I played for Hibs in seven of them uh, at the, I was only about 20 then I was I was strong and, 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 and fit um, and I played with two of my I played with a guy called Martin Green, who I said was the best footballer I ever seen in Europe. And there's another guy played on a team called um, Derek Bradley. And Derek was a big, strong lad, no skill, uh, couldn't head the ball, couldn't pass the ball, uh, couldn't couldn't control the ball. But he was the best player I ever played with because he was so much. He was so he, he drew the team forward. He was so det- he was so determined. He was an absolute an absolute brilliant captain and. And he encouraged the players. And that's what you need at times. That's what you need. Yeah, you, you need a leader on the you field. You need a leader on the field. And he was so strong. And no matter what happened, he would go on. The, the footballers, now you touch them and they're down. Derek would have been through a wall and come out the other side and run on. He was so, so determined, so strong, so brave, you know? Yeah. So, um, so that's basically my football career. Wasn't there's not a lot, not a lot that, not a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what they say if you can't do right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so then you decided to write. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I did that wee book uh, on the um, junior football. Junior football in your area. Well, that book is amazing. You've got some brilliant stories in there. You have to tell us a couple of those stories because, okay. um, you know, t- 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 what what would be one of your favourite stories from that book? Because do you know what I love about that book is that it's it's not like just this encyclopedic, you know, just trawl through this and that and you know it, it, there's all these funny little anecdotes and funny little stories there's a referee um a referee called it a uh, pat campbell he was a little pat campbell and pat says um i uh, call the boy over and he says off you go what for um for using bad language now f off to the lane <laughs> <laughs> there was um there was another story um the referee didn't turn up the managers of both teams decided they would 
referee one half of each of each of of of, of, of the game each. So there's a, I think they're both dead now. Um, there was a little mercy of his part that he decided mercy was very shrewd, and he decided he would like he would like he would referee the second half. And uh, so. Uh, and, and anything your boy gave him in the first half, he could rectify it in the second half. But anyway, um, the, the, first, the referee in the first half was uh, Jim McCardner. And uh, Jim came off at half time and um, was the Mully, uh, the Mully were playing. I forget who the were playing. Um, but anyway, Mercy Fitz came on, who was one of the players in the Mully team, was injured, and Jim McCardner, who was referee in the first half, came on a sub. And he give off. He he started to uh, give off to to Billy Fitzpatrick, the referee. So after listening for a while, Billy says, "Right off you go." So that was the only game I think in history that the referee was sent off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there's loads. There's, there's loads of wee. There's loads of wee unusual story. There was another one of um, a guy called Austin Mullen, who. Um, who played in both semi-finals of the one com- cup competition? Okay. So uh, he played the first week for Windmill Stars, and they were beaten. And in the meantime, the manager of the team was playing in the second semi-final. Um, asked, could he um, could he be transferred? And he was transferred, and there was no rule. It was, was no cup tie. There was there was no rule to say that you were cup tied if you played yeah. in it. So he actually played in both semi-finals. Of the same competition, and lost both of them. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't have to worry about playing in the final. Then. No, he didn't worry about playing in the final. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was that. That was your um your book about junior football around here. But I mean, the the history of of Newry and the history of I mean, you you wrote a book, another book, then about where was it about? Derry Beg. Derry Beg. Yeah. I wrote the history of Derry Beg. I was I lived in Derry Beg for. Um, a good few years for after I left Lynn Hall Square, I went to I went to uh, Derry Beg, and Derry Beg is one of the biggest estates in Europe. And it 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 it's sold out. It's sold out. I don't think you can get copies of it now at all. Yeah. It it was it, it, it You must have well. done. You must have had had to do an awful lot of research for this stuff, or is it just from living here all your life in the you know around this area, so that you know so you know all the characters because. You know, there are so many characters. Oh, that's the new is full of characters. Yeah, and they're great to write about as well. Yeah, you know, and uh, like there's a there's a like of there's a guy called Daisy McGandy, uh, who 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 lives in in Derry Bay, and he was he was an absolutely he was an absolutely cracking character. Yeah, uh, and there was a lot of other there was a, a woman called Laddie McCone, who lived in Hall Square as the barracks as well as living in um living in Derry Bay, and. Uh, she, she, she was a brilliant character as well. There's a lot, lots of lots of lots of Newry's full of characters. Yeah, you know, and it's if you can get access to the stories, it makes great reading. I think. Yeah. Uh, and enjoyed every book. Every book. Uh, every book I've written, I really, really enjoyed it. You sort of you get immersed in the whole. Yeah. What you're writing. Yeah. I could write maybe four or five hours in a day. You know, unfortunately, I, unfortunately, I keep all my. All the st- all the stories I've written through from I started in journalism from ninety six I think it was ninety or ninety four something like that. See, I've, I write the name on them. There's a lot of people. A lot of people, especially pictures. Uh, um, a lot of photographers don't put the name. I would write the name. It takes it takes a while to do it, but it means if you go back looking for um, it's not just a number. Not not nine not seven six five. Yeah, yeah, I'm guilty of that. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> so that makes it makes it makes it, t- it takes a lot of time to write it at, to to go through all your stuff and put names on it. But it's worth it whenever you whenever you're really looking for something and it comes up no bother. Yeah, well that's it. And you've inspired me, Tony, to go home and sort out my, <laughs> sort out my stuff. Although um, I, it was said to me the other day, um, what was it? Apparently, an Einstein quote, and this was Brian. Um, he said, "If the sign of a." No, hold on, I have to get this right. If a cluttered desk is a sign of a cluttered mind, then what's an empty desk the sign of? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it makes me feel not so bad about my cluttered desk. <laughs> All right, no, no, well, if, if you look at any any uh, any journalist desk, it's full of it's full of papers and everything. Like, 
It's, uh, yeah, but I bet you you can find what you're looking for. <laughs> I try to. I try to um, make it easy to find things, but um, obviously don't always. It doesn't always work, but I, I try my best. Yeah. yeah, because especially if you're if you are if you are somebody who writes a lot of books and things like that, you you need to be organised. Yeah, you need, your archives need to be in some semblance of order, you know. Yeah, well, you see, and if people send me stuff, uh, or if I get if I get books, if I get um, scrapbooks of people, I will actually photocopy the piece and save it as salic piece or something like that, you know, so yeah. that I can find that again if I'm, if I'm looking for it. And you've got loads of stuff now to show your grandkids and to pass down, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's an um, important part of it for you, is it? I think that the most important book that I've written was the history, the Bagnell family okay. history. And it's not so great now, but my grandchildren will will get... It, it'll be great for them whenever, they, whenever in 20, 30 years' time uh, they'll be able to say... My my grandfather and my great grandfather did this and did the other and and have it. Um, yeah, because families don't have that, you know. It's, it's no, a, and if somebody dies, like they, a lot of times their history goes with them, you know. That's right. Yeah, uh, because one it's not of, recorded. One of my big regrets in life is that when I was growing up, I didn't ask my mother and father about their lives. Yeah, and it, so so result, I didn't really know a lot about that. Yeah, and it's true, and it's probably true for an awful lot of us that we don't ask enough questions, yeah. and then and then when they're gone, the stories are gone too. Yeah, maybe. But um, the Irish, we are a, a nation of storytellers, you know. That's right. Yeah. Well, maybe granddaughter was ta- I was talking to her on the phone the other night, and um, I says, "Who are you cheering for when England was playing Italy?" And she says, "Italy, Italy." She says, <laughs> "I'm gonna say, well, it's the same as everybody." Hey, did you know? Did you know that you're English relatives? Oh, I said your daddy's your daddy's granny was English. Oh, was she? I said yes. Go into the bag and go, go up the go, take out the bag and the book and read it. It's there about uh, your, your, your that your son, your father's granny, uh, yeah, was English. You know, yeah. So it's there for it's there for them to, to, to check it out at a later date. Yeah, you know. But that was that's the book that I've I, I, I took most pride at. Yeah, or most pride at doing. That, that, because it was probably the most personal one to you. Yes, exactly, and yeah. it means that all the family have the history of the Bagnell family. It's not much. It's not. It's not really um, relevant to you or to anybody else, but it's re- relevant to the Bagnell family. Yeah. So, uh, and that's the one that gave me most pleasure. I'd say the, the probably the best book. You're no relation to ba- anyone from Bagnell's Castle. I suppose you've been asked that all the time. No, I don't. Th- I don't think I am. Yeah. Uh, I, I, used, I used to tell people that. Um, it was one time Bagnell's own Yuri. Really? Yeah, the, 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 I think it was a, a guy called um, Marshall Bagnell, I think it was. And he came in and took over Yuri. I've lost most of it since then. <laughs> <laughs> um, it must have been your bad guitar playing. <laughs> <laughs> or bad football. Or, 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 or hard to do running. <laughs> or whatever, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, you're very modest, Tony. <laughs> no, no, I don't think I'm modest. I think I'm honest. Yeah, because I think it's important. That it's important to realize in life what you're good at and what you're not. I see people on, you know, those talent shows. Yeah. And the good thing to say their lives. They they can't. I can't understand why they can't hear that they're not singing in tune or their their singing's awful. And why nobody told them. No, they can hear. They should be able to hear it themselves. Yeah, but some people are tone deaf, so they probably can't hear that they're. Yeah, but why are they? Why are they on a talent show? Well, if you're talking about things like the X Factor, that's usually just for entertainment value. I don't find it very entertaining when I hear people who can't sing. I just feel sorry. Yeah, for them. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, why? But they, they seem indignant and annoyed at the at the at the judges saying they can't sing. On the they're not good. Yeah. Surely they can hear that. I mean, I'm singing. When I get up and I just I, my party piece was Johnny Be Good by Chuck Berry, and I know that I, I know that 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 it's not good. You know I can hear them, me not hitting the, I'm not hitting the notes properly. Yeah. But then again, the noise. But you persevered. Was, but the, no, the noise <laughs> in the background sort of drowns out a bit. <laughs> so. Yeah. So anyway, what 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 what's up next, Tony? You're um you're going to be working on this windmill book. Uh, the windmill book actually. Uh, the windmill book actually. 
finished. But it was, I was actually at an interview with um, with uh, Windmill Chairman this morning, John John O'Hanlon. Yeah. And uh, he asked me to put in a few more we a few more pits of junior football and whatever uh, youth football teams and whatever. And, I, and if a few ads it got, but that's just basically it. Yeah. That, that's um the Windmill books. The Windmill book is is. Uh, so have you anything else in the pipeline? No. No, I'm, I'm, I'm available for offers. You're available. <laughs> <laughs> if there's yeah. anybody out there who needs um, somebody to join a band or... <laughs> <laughs> no, to write a book for them. To write a book for them, yeah. yeah. Because, yeah. yeah, that's the thing. You write books for, you know, clubs and stuff that ask you to write books. Yeah. 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 And uh, last, year, uh, um, last year I wrote... The making of Paddy Moe. Oh yes, was, so yeah, I wanted to ask it was, about that. It was Paddy. It was Paddy. It was a a guy called Liam Hayes who was a All Ireland winner, All Ireland chapman with Meath, who owns a publishing company in Dublin. Contacted me and asked me where to write it, and um, Paddy Dougley was my father's big hero. So uh, I get down. I would, I was down and visited Paddy and his wife Angela, uh, maybe five or six times before. Covid really kicked in, and I couldn't go down to see him. You're doing it, a lot on Facebook. You're doing these wonderful stories all the time. I love reading your stories. Well, thanks very much. Elliot. Yeah, Thank they you. really are. They're brilliant. They're uh, all, all the characters of the day are in there, and you always have some great stories. Thank you. Yeah, I th- people do seem to enjoy them. Uh, okay, you know, so and 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 enjoy writing and enjoy um, the people, the comments of people. Um, Send in, and I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm making new friends all the time. Yeah. You know, and people that people that I uh, maybe had I'd known a few years ago, I'm I'm re- reacquainting myself with them. Yeah. You know. Well, that's the, that's one good thing about social media. And yeah. Is that you do connect, get to connect with people like that. Yeah, and you don't, and it's safe. You're not nasty. Well, you know, yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of nastiness on it. Um, but anything I say, um, I can't imagine anybody's nasty in any of yours, are they? No, I, I would say not. I would, I would, I. Would, you I don't, don't say like... anything that offensive. It's always a bit of fun. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I uh, mean, there's slagging going on, but it's oh, fair, ah, yes, it's yeah. fairly slagging. You know, it's not, you see, uh, it's not nasty. There's you nothing see, nasty. I, and have we have a wee quote and in Yuri, um, in Yuri, yeah, you're about to be insulted and ignored, <laughs> and and you are insulted and you're everybody insults you, but um. When you're insulted in Yuri, it's 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 not meant as an insult. I don't think no. people might call you all the names a day, and you know that that they like you. <laughs> well, maybe that's maybe that's just an Irish. Maybe it's not just a Yuri trait. Maybe it's, Ar- it's I think an Irish. I think trait. it's an Irish trait. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, definitely around here, you do see that. Yeah, yeah. But I said it's um, and I said it's bad. It's better to be insulted and ignored and. Uh, I've been assaulted all my life. <laughs> so you just keep telling yourself that, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, no, that's the truth. It uh, is the truth, yeah. All right. It's all been right. great talking to you. Oh, thanks very much. And thanks very much. And um, looking forward to having a look at the next book. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that chat with Tony as much as I did. Um, as I said, he always puts plenty of stories up on Facebook so you can check them out there and I'm sure you can contact him there if you want to um, get a hold of any of his books as well. Make sure you keep getting all of your news from Arma I and I hope you join us next time for our podcast. From the I don't know what to say. I'm just speechless. To the I can't, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. We see all sorts of life-changing moments at McKinney Competitions. How would you react? Cars, houses, tech bundles and more from just two pounds a ticket. No purchase necessary. For competitions, rules and conditions, see McKinneyCompetitions.com.